and he's going to tell us more about uh, sketching high dimensional data. Okay, great. So yeah, I'll just continue where I left off on Friday. So if you remember Friday, I talked to you. Um, I talked to you about <clears throat> approximate counting. And also the distinct elements problem. And here we, we talked a little bit about pseudo randomness and KY's independent hash functions. And then <clears throat> I gave both an idealized and a real algorithm. And if you remember the real algorithm looked something like um, we have this data structure that I called the simple data structure. And we had log n instantiations of it. And then we have this hash function, which mapped the universe into, <clears throat> um, into a range of that size, where the probability that h of i equals j was something like 1 over 2 to the j, right? And each one of these data structures <clears throat> solved the following problem. If the support size of x is at most k, basically return x, else output, you know, x is too dense, has too many non-zero entries, right? So hopefully this sounds familiar. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, for our query, we basically started from the bottom we queried simple log n it probably said that x is the zero vector or at least x projected to everything that hashed to that level was the zero vector and we worked our way up until we got something non-zero and once we got that we got some kind of rough constant approximation to the answer to the number of distinct elements or the support size of x that let us zoom in on one level that would provide a good one plus epsilon approximation and we got we, we basically queried that data structure and then scaled back up by some two to the J. So <clears throat> that's where we were on Friday. And today I want to talk about a couple things. One is I want to talk about impossibility results, proving lower bounds against uh, data structures or against us, uh, you know, sketching algorithms. And then I also want to talk about um, something related to a question someone asked last time. Maybe it was Daniel actually, or I can't remember who asked the question, Daniel the douche, maybe someone else. Um, can you, you know, how do you handle deletions as well? <clears throat> and um, I want to talk about that because the way, you know, actually this, this template of an algorithm I'm showing here, you right here with this login levels and these simple data structures, it's very easy to turn this template into something that works for deletions as well. And um, one of the tools that will allow us to generalize to streams with deletions, that tool will also transition well into the next topic or another topic, which is um, sketching for graphs. Okay, um, we're gonna, you're going to see we're going to basically treat graphs as n choose two dimensional vectors, where n is the number of vertices, n choose two is you know the total number of edges that could exist in the graph, and as you insert and delete edges from the graph, you're basically updating this underlying vector, and we're going to do some linear algebra to to get some sketching for graphs. Okay, so anyway, that's a little foreshadowing. <clears throat> but for now, let's continue along this path and let's start talking about impossibility results. Okay, so what did we saw? Uh, if you want, one plus epsilon approximation with probability at least one minus delta for distinct elements. This is possible in small space. Um, I told you what the optimal bound is. The optimal bound turns out to be one over epsilon squared log one over delta plus log n. I didn't show you the proof of this bound, the bound I showed, you know, what follows from what we discussed on Friday is worse than this by logarithmic factors. 
but you know, I, I did show you something that gets you kind of one or epsilon squared log squared n log one over delta. Uh, this particular bound, as I mentioned, the upper bound is due to Yaroslav Blaschek in 2018. Uh, and the lower bound, I, I gave those citations on Friday. So, you know, we could, the, the fact that we can get this, you know, spurs on to natural questions. One is, okay, did we really need to settle for approximation? And did we really need to settle for uh, a Monte Carlo randomized result? Like, can we just get something that a deterministic algorithm that works with probability one? And what I'll show you is that both of these forms of slack are necessary if you want to achieve sublinear memory. So we will see you need both approximation and randomization to achieve sublinear memory. Specifically, if you want to achieve little o of n memory. Okay. So first, <laughs> Let me show you why you cannot <clears throat> hope to solve the problem deterministically and exactly. You're going to need at least one of these two. So, so claim deterministic plus exact requires linear memory. And by the way, um, the fact that you need both approximation and randomization, this was first shown by uh, Alone, Matthias and Segedi. Okay, so why do you need linear memory? <clears throat> the proof is going to be via an encoding argument. And I'll also show a second proof that's, I mean, at, that's very similar, but a uh, phrase in the language of communication complexity. But first, let's just start with this encoding argument. So the claim is that if there exists a space S algorithm that's both deterministic and exact, then there exists an injection. I'll call the injection injection ENC for encoding that maps n-bit strings into s-bit strings, OK? So of course, um, if this thing is an injection, that already tells you that s has to be at least n, right? So what is this encoding? Um, the encoding of some string, some binary string b, is going to be just the memory footprint um, let's call this algorithm a so if there exists a space s algorithm a then there exists this injection this is the memory footprint of a after being run on the stream that contains <clears throat> all i such that bi is one, right? So if b is, um, if b is, you know, let's say 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0. So these are the indices, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Then the stream here is 3, 4, 5, right? And I'm writing that toward the bottom, but I think you can see that, um, right? So we have some binary string B and bits. The N is six here. Um, we just look at where all the ones are. We put that into a stream. We run the algorithm A on that stream. Now it has some S bit memory footprint. That memory footprint is the encoding. It's that this is this defines the injection of B, uh, uh, the injection applied to B. Okay. And how can I prove to you that it's an injection? I can prove to you that it's an injection by showing you that I can invert it, you know. So uh, what's 
the encoding inverse of something. Um, <coughs> I'll just call this the decoding. Basically, um, start the algorithm A with memory footprint D. Okay. First step, <clears throat> T gets to uh, A dot query. So what is this now? This is just, this is just gonna be equal to the support size of B, right? And then for I equals one to N, I'm going to say um, feed I to A in the stream. And then, uh, <coughs> sorry, I don't know, just write it like this. A1 is A dot query. Actually, I should have done it like this. Whoops. And is anyone, okay, so I don't know what just happened, but my iPad just got disconnected from the Zoom. What's going on here? Okay, I'm back in the Zoom. I think it was just some internet connectivity issue. But unfortunately, the whiteboard has uh, completely died. So I need to, okay, so that's okay. I guess this now, I should have learned from Ramon and used uh, iPad use the Apple Notes instead of using the Zoom whiteboard because I guess if, if for some reason you get disconnected and reconnect your whiteboard completely disappears. Um, so anyway, so let's just go back to where we were. You can see this right. Okay, good. So the decoding the decoding applied to some memory footprint. So what do we do? We say we boot up. <clears throat> A with memory footprint D, and then we say, <clears throat> actually, we just do the following. So for I equals one to N, uh, say T gets A dot query, and then we'll say uh, feed I to A in the stream. So in other words, let's say a dot update i. So we just saw i, and then uh, t prime gets a dot query, <clears throat> um, So what's going on here? Basically, remember now we booted up a with the memory footprint from d, right? What is d? D is the memory footprint of A after being run on B, on the binary string B. So right, this, this, here, this here is just the encoding of some B. So the very first time we go through this loop, T is just the support size of B. Then we feed one to the, we feed one to the algorithm. How does that change the number of distinct elements? Well, okay, I don't know what is happening, but I got booted out of the iPad Zoom again. Anyone have any idea of why this uh, <laughs> why this could be happening? I don't know. I'm not a Zoom. I did I did read an article about some Zoom crashing, but this this doesn't seem to be that right because I do have. I'm still in the Zoom. It just keeps kicking me out of my whiteboard and then blanking out my whiteboard. Jelani, would you be able to use um, the Apple Notes? Apple. Yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm going to use Apple Notes because this is uh, this is going to be a problem. So it looks like I have to share my entire screen. Uh, 
Okay, so this this is now working, hopefully. With some delay, maybe. Huh. Okay, good. It is, it's there, it's just there's some delay. So anyway, that's good enough. <clears throat> Okay, so sorry about that. Let's keep going. Um, so I said for i equals one to n, t gets a dot query. And then I said a dot update i, and then t prime gets a dot query. Okay, so, <clears throat> so what's going on here? Um, at first, what has A seen in the stream? Well, we booted up A with the memory footprint D, which is just the encoding of B. So initially, what A has seen in the stream is exactly the support of B. So every time we go through this loop, we're at some index of I from one to N. If I was already in the support of B, then you know, feeding it again to A is not going to change the number of distinct elements, right? Uh, but if it's something new that wasn't already in the support of B, then it will it will change the number of distinct elements. It'll increment the number of distinct elements by one, right? So every time we go through the loop, basically que the query will go up by one or it will stay the same. And if it goes up by one, that's something that's not in the support. If it doesn't go up by one, that's something that was in the support. So let's say there's a step zero here. Or, okay, so let's say this is the answer, which initially is the empty set. And then we say, if t is equal to t prime, so the number of distinct elements did not go up, then we know that this thing was in the support. Right, so this, this thing here now is, is going to be b. Okay, so good. So this is, this is a valid, uh, this is, this inverts the encoding. So I've just shown you that it's an injection. Okay. <clears throat> now, another way to just to show the same lower bound is via um, communication complexity. And this is a simple case. It, get, it can get more sophisticated, but the idea here is, you know, you have two parties. Usually, they're called Alice and Bob. Alice has some input from some domain. Bob has some input from some domain. They both also know some function f. And they would like to compute f after sending some communication back and forth. In this case, we'll look at the, we'll look at the case where um, Alice just sends a single message to Bob, and then Bob. So Alice, based on her input x, sends this message to Bob, and then Bob, based on the message together with his input, then spits out the answer to the to the problem. So basically, outputs the function evaluation that we want. Okay. <clears throat> Um, so this is one-way communication and one round. Basically, Alice is one way because Alice is only talking to Bob. Um, in general, in communication complexity, you could have multiple rounds. Alice and Bob talk together with each other back and forth. You could have more than two players. Um, we'll talk maybe about that later, but just this is, a, this is a very simple setting. So specifically for distinct elements, We can say x equals y equals 0, 1 to the n. And f of x, y is just the equality function. We just want to know whether the two strings are equal. So theorem, which I'm, it's simple to show, but I'm not going to show it today, is that um, the communication complexity, basically, you need to send at least n bits of communication 
to solve equality. Okay. This is true even if actually they talk back and forth. Okay, so now the claim is if there exists a space S algorithm for distinct elements, then there exists a protocol, a communication protocol for equality where the message length is equal to S. And then by the previous theorem, this implies that S has to be at least N. Okay. Um, and what's the, you know, how do you, again, it's very similar to what we just saw. How would you design a communication protocol for this, for this communication game based on an algorithm for distinct elements? <clears throat> Well, Alice can just, you know, just like as before, look at the support of X, feed all elements in the support of X as a stream to A, take the memory contents of A and send that as a message to Bob. So that's M, M is just the memory of A. What's Bob going to do now to decide equality? The first thing he's going to do is he's going to query A. That's gonna tell him the support size of X, okay? If the support size of X and the support size of Y aren't the same, then already he knows that X and Y are not the same. He can output, no, these are not equal strings. On the other hand, if X and Y do have the same support size, then what he does next is he just feeds Y into the stream, namely the support of Y into the stream, okay? And if these two strings are not equal, there will be something in Y's support that's not in X's support and that will increase the number of distinct elements. So when he when he queries again for the number of distinct elements, it will have gone up. So if it did go up, he can again say, no, these are not equal strings. And if it didn't go up, then he knows that, yes, these are equal strings and he's decided equality. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. So again, in the language of communication complexity, you can get, you can get the lower bound via reduction from the equality problem. Okay, but this is like this is a common theme in streaming algorithms. If you can prove that a certain communication problem is hard and then show a reduction from that problem to your streaming problem, then it implies that your streaming problem is hard. Okay. Um, so that shows that you can't have a sublinear algorithm if it's both exact and deterministic. But what if it's only deterministic, but it's not exact? What if we're willing to have a one plus epsilon approximation, but deterministic. It's always guaranteed to be a one plus epsilon approximation. You know, is that possible? Um, and we're gonna see, no, that also requires linear communication or linear question. Yeah. The things in your proof, I'm not sure I understand correctly. It seems yeah. in your proof that you require to be correct for all the curious times, right? Yeah, so I'm because right, that's right. Because but, I was proving that a deterministic algorithm, deterministic exact algorithm, is impossible in some linear memory. But I can still ask. My goal is to be correct at a specific time. Does that change the picture? What do you mean? What do you mean by at a specific time? How do you I define? You have the streaming data. My goal is to try to store, make make some storage of the data I see, so that say at a thousand steps, I can tell how many uh, distinct elements there are. You mean you mean at, at the end? Yeah, the so yeah, at the end. I, but I don't care whether in the in between I'm correct or not. Right, but, but okay, but the, the thing is, uh, like your algorithm doesn't know when the end is, right? So each one of those times that there was a query, I could have just imagined that that was the end. So your algorithm had better be correct there, right? I see. Okay. I don't know. If, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, if you want, or if you want me to say it differently, like, you know, just imagine that, you know, th so there, there was some here in that for loop, there was a, some alternating updates and queries, right? But I could have, I could have imagined, you know, every time that I wanted to do a query, just restart the memory at, from scratch at D and then just keep doing all the updates I did to that point and then do one query, do that one query. And, and that, I mean, that's like the end, right? I mean, your, your algorithm doesn't know that the difference between that and the end. 
uh, okay, hopefully that made some sense. Um, okay, so I want to rule out this too. Can I have a deterministic algorithm that's a one plus epsilon approximation? And the answer is um, I cannot. And the reason is basically um, error correcting code. So what I'm going to do is you know, the claim is there exists a subset B of zero one to the N such that um, first of all, <clears throat> let's say like, oops, let's go ahead and hide this. Um, the size of B is at least, you know, exponential in N to what? Okay. I don't know why. I'm not saying anything wrong. <laughs> yeah, okay. Somehow this thing has a mind of its own. Is it working now? No. Am I even still? Your iPad is no longer connected. Oh, it's not in the Zoom at all. So maybe it's actually just an internet connectivity issue. Can no, you connect your one. iPad by Bluetooth, Johnny? Connect my iPad, but no, I'm, I'm, it's just separately on the Wi-Fi. You, you um, don't have a cable or something to connect it to your laptop? Um, maybe that's possible. I, it's just too technologically advanced for me. <laughs> um, what, what kind of laptop do you have? Uh, I'm just, I'm running Ubuntu Linux on a ThinkPad. Jelani, is there any way to use the, the laptop you're currently on? To yeah, maybe I could try to just use the laptop itself. It, it, it does have a touch screen. It's just that it's, uh, it's not as good quality. Um, okay, so maybe, wait, just give me one second. I'm going to try to rejoin. Yeah, it seems my, my iPad got booted out from the Zoom entirely. So let me, I'll try to do this on my laptop, but we'll see how that goes. Oh, wait, okay. Well, in the meantime, there's a question. Does the proof you sure. were going to say also work for C approximation? So is it more time? That, does the proof work for C approximation, not just one minus delta, I suppose? Um, the proof I'm going to show you is specifically for one plus epsilon approximation. There is another paper by Amit Chakrabarty and one other co-author whose name I'm forgetting right now that, that, does, that does prove linear lower bounds even for larger constant approximations. And by the way, my iPad is back in, so um, I can, let's try to do this again. Okay. So yeah, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, basically there's a code. There's, there's an exponentially large subset of the Hamming cube such that um, all these things are far from each other. Oh dear, what is, okay. Um, for, for, actually, let me just say this, another thing. So for all B and B, let's say um, the size of B, so B is a set, or the support size of B, I should say, um, is equal to say, and over a hundred and for all B not equal to B prime. Uh, let's say, um, can we get B intersect B prime? Is that most say N over a hundred squared maybe times some constant times three or something. So the intersections are quite small. 
the, you know, what, how do you prove this? You can prove it by just picking these strings randomly. So, you know, if you, if you imagine, <clears throat> each one, you know, break up the, break up the bits into blocks of size 100 so that they're in over 100 blocks. And then each, in each block, just pick a random location and, and make that one and make the rest of the string zero, right? So that will give you a random element. Uh, and do this now, do this now many times independently, and you get a bunch of random vectors in zero, one to the n. And you can prove that as long as you don't take too many of them, you take exponentially big in n, but not too big, but too, too, you know, exp of cn where c is not too big, then you can prove that with high probability. Um, all of these things satisfy item two, namely that all their pairwise intersections are small. Okay. Now, um, claim, you know, uh, one plus epsilon approximation for eps sufficiently small. implies um, an encoding from B into 0, 1 to the S. So this implies that S has to be at least the logarithm of the size of B, right? Which is omega n. Does that make sense? And what's the encoding? Again, the encoding of uh, of a string <clears throat> b is just the memory contents. I'm sorry, memory contents of a after running on the support of b. Okay, and what is the decoding? So the decoder, I mean, there's there's an exponential time decoder that works. So first of all, you know, the decoder knows that if it were to query right now, the answer would be you know n over a hundred, right? The number the number of distinct elements it's seen is n over a hundred because it's the support of b. B all the all the b's have support size the same, which is n over a hundred. Now what it's going to do is it's going to do an exponential time decoding. It's going to loop. It doesn't know what b is though, right? It doesn't know what original string we ran the encoding on. It's going to just guess B. There are only exponentially many possibilities for B. It's going to just loop over all of them and try them. And for each one, it's going to insert the support of that into the stream and ask whether or not the number of distinct elements you know, change significantly. If our guess was correct, the number of distinct elements won't change. So our answer will be within one plus epsilon of n over 100. Okay. However, if our guess, sorry, if our, if our guess was correct, then the number of distinct elements didn't change. So our answer will, will approximately not change. If our, if our guess was incorrect, then the, the number of distinct elements almost doubled, right? Because if our, if, our number, if our guess was incorrect and we're guessing some B prime, then B prime and B have almost no overlap. So almost the entire support of B prime is disjoint from the support of B. So we've almost doubled the number of distinct elements we've seen in the stream, right? And if we have, a, so if we have a one plus epsilon approximation, think of epsilon as, you know, one tenth or something, then we can tell the difference between staying the same and nearly doubling, okay? Um, so we can, we can basically tell when we've, when we've guessed correctly. Does that make sense? So, um, Guess all B prime in B in sequence and return the first one where A dot query basically barely changed. You know, it only changed by 10% or something. So I don't know, John, you look, you look uh, troubled. Oh, no, maybe not. Maybe I just, uh... so any questions? OK. OK, so um, that's, so that shows that you can't, you can't even have a, a one plus epsilon approximation that's deterministic. 
But another thing you could, you could check is, can I have an exact algorithm that's randomized? So I'm willing to succeed with probably 99%. I'm willing to fail 1% of the time. But when I do succeed, I want to have the exact answer, not, a, not, a, not an approximate answer. And um, I think since I lost some time due to technical issues, I'm not going to spend time on that proof. But you can use error correcting codes again, basically the same construction of codes, to prove again that it implies that you have an injection from a, from a very large set to a smaller set. Um, therefore, S has to be at least omega n. So you can't have a deterministic approximate algorithm. You can't have a randomized exact algorithm. So you need to have both randomization and approximation if you want to get something in your memory. Okay. Um, so good. So you've seen we've seen one algorithm and out of sync elements, both upper bounds and lower bounds. Um, I want to move into another topic, um, which is graphs for the rest of today. And before I do that, I'm going to go back to distinct elements and answer a question from Friday about how do you also handle like general turnstile streams where there could be deletions in the stream? Because um, the way to the way to solve that is going to be very related to the graph thing that I want to show you. So okay, so back back to distinct elements upper bound. And what if the stream has deletions? Okay. So the stream could be like um, <clears throat> one, you know, one, five, and then someone wants to, uh, let's say, delete one, delete one. So red means delete. And then now we see three. So here the number of distinct elements or the support size is two. There's the five and there's the three. The ones got deleted. Okay. So if you look back at the data structure we saw before, the one that had all these, this, this login levels, Um, I claim that you can use a similar kind of setup to solve even the case of deletion. So I called it before the simple data structure. Actually, that simple data structure was solving a problem I'll call case sparse recovery. K recovery one, K recovery two, et cetera. So what is this K recovery problem, this case sparse recovery problem? We want a sketch of a vector x such that um, we can do updates. So update i comma delta says xi gets xi plus delta. And then we also want to handle uh, queries that work as follows. If the support size of x is at most k, then return x. Else, you know, you're allowed to do anything. You're allowed to silently fail. I mean, there are versions where you don't silently fail. There are also versions where you um, you just say fail. It's not k sparse. Okay. So. In insertion, when it's insertion only, handling case, you know, solving case sparse recovery was very simple. This was the data structure that I called the simple data structure. You just remember the first k distinct, you know, things you see in the stream, and then if you ever see the k plus first thing, then you just say fail, right? This is not a case sparse vector anymore, and that uses something like k log n bits of memory, for k log n memory. Um, the, the trouble now is when you have both insertions and deletions. You know, I could, I could have a, ver a vector that starts at zero. It gets very dense because I, I see all the coordinates. And then after I see all the coordinates, I start subtracting most of the coordinates so that only k are left, or at most k are left. Then at query time, the support size is small. 
even though at intermediate time steps it, it was very dense, at query time support size is small. So I do need to be able to report X at that query time. Okay. So how do I do it? Um, I'll assume, because I want to do, you know, I, I said that X is a real vector, but we're, we're counting everything in bits here. So we'll assume that, you know, uh, all updates are integers. And so we're promised that, you know, no entry of X is ever bigger than say t, some T in magnitude. Okay. And I can, let's round up so that, you know. Lenny, are you writing? We only say we're assume. At least I only say that. Oh, yeah. So I am writing. Uh -oh. Okay. So it looks like there's just some delay here. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so round up so that, you know, T is a prime power. Okay. So I just want to say F of F T is a finite field. Um, so what are we going to do? We're going to maintain via, we'll maintain what's called a linear sketch. And linear sketching is again one of these things that's a kind of a common technique in the design of sketching algorithms. And I see that there's still more lag here, unfortunately. Um, so I think I don't know if it's my Wi-Fi or if it's Zoom because it's weird. My laptop and my iPad are on the same exact Wi-Fi network, but my my laptop is working great and my iPad keeps having these connectivity issues. Uh, hmm. Hold on. Okay, so I think I'm back, right? Okay, good. The linear sketching, I should say. So the idea here is we're going to maintain pi x in memory, where pi is a matrix that's very short but wide, right? Remember that x is n-dimensional, and pi is going to have only, like, say, m rows, where, you know, m is much less than n. So the point is, rather than, main, rather than remembering this huge n-dimensional object in memory, we're only going to remember m things in memory, so it's going to use much less memory. So the question is, how do we then design this matrix pi that lets us solve this case sparse recovery problem? Um, and you know, not only the matrix, but also the, the query algorithm that goes together with the matrix. Okay. So the matrix pi for us for the case sparse recovery problem is as follows. So, you know, the first column is going to be 1, x1, x1 squared, up to x1 to the m minus 1, and then 1, x2, x2 squared, up to x2 to the m minus 1, etc. 1, xn, xn to the m minus 1. And what's the property we want, right? Basically, we just we want to be able to do case sparse recovery, which means that if x and y, let's say x and y are case sparse, and x is not equal to y, we want that pi x is not equal to pi y. Because if they're not equal, then at least in principle, you know, this, this map is an injection, so we can recover the underlying case sparse vector. And this is the same thing as saying that pi times x minus y is not equal to 0. And x minus y here is 2k sparse. Oh, I reached the bottom here, so this is 2k sparse. So what we want is we want a matrix pi such that it doesn't have any 2k sparse vectors in its kernel, right? So, you know, if I pick a matrix pi like this, which is this kind of Vandermond matrix, then what does it mean that to not have any 2k sparse vectors in its kernel? It means that 
if you look at any submatrix of pi formed by taking 2k columns of pi, so take any submatrix formed by taking 2k columns, that submatrix has full column rank. Okay. Which I can achieve by setting M to be uh, basically 2K, right? So as long as the XIs are distinct and I pick 2K rows, then any submatrix with 2K columns is a square Vandermond matrix, which I know, you know, had, is non singular. Okay. Um, so good. So, so that that basically works. Okay. So. Uh, um, so this is this is the replacement um, for the simple data structure in the case where I want to also be able to support deletions. Okay. So any questions about this? I guess I, what I didn't talk about is what's the actual algorithm. You know, when I say query, how do I get back the case sparse vector? So one thing that definitely works is basically. Uh, loop over all n choose k possibilities for where the support could be, and then solve a linear system and see if what you get back is actually k-sparse. Okay. And the first time you get something that's actually k-sparse, you say, here it is, here's the k-sparse vector, right? It might give me something that's up to 2k-sparse because I'm solving a 2k by 2k linear system. But if it gives me something with, with sparsity more than k, then I know that you know, my guess for the support was wrong. And if it gives me something that is k-sparse, then because this thing is an, is an injection, I know that what it returned to me is the right answer. So that's an exponential time decoding. It turns out that there is a polynomial time decoding. It takes time roughly k squared, maybe with some log factors. Um, it's basically the same thing as what's called syndrome decoding in the correct in the error correcting codes literature, syndrome decoding of reed solomon codes. Um, it's very similar to Prony's method, if people have heard of that. I'm not gonna go over it today. But there is also a time efficient query algorithm to actually get back the case sparse vector. Um, okay. So that's basically it. If you just replace the simple data structure with this, then you get something that can also support deletions. So before I move on now, now that you've seen this data structure, before I move on, any questions? Okay. So let's keep going. And let's hope that my iPad stays connected. I'm like, I'm holding my iPad at a certain angle that, uh, that I think like maximizes the Wi Fi uh, <laughs> reception, but we'll see whether that works. Okay, so um, I want to move into an example of using this, this case sparse recovery data structure graph sketch for graph sketching. So there are two models here. Um, one model is you, you have this graph. Okay. Where you can imagine that each vertex in this graph is some agent that only knows local information. It only knows its own neighborhood in the graph. So, you know, this, this, um, This person here can only see basically that it can only see this edge and this edge, right? It only knows stuff that's connected to it. Okay. So in this model of computation, um, this look kind of local model, this distributed model here where everyone has local information, you imagine that there's like some central server. And then each vertex, knowing only the local information, has to send a message. So let's call this, you know, uh, this is vertex one, this is vertex two, three, four, five. Vertex one will send a message based on its information, M1, to the central server. This will also send a message, M3, this will send a message, M2, et cetera. And then the central server then has to compute the answer. For example, give me a spanning tree of the graph, or is you know is the graph connected, or find me the minimum spanning tree, or find me a, you know a matching of minimum cost, you know min cost max matching or something, right? Whatever graph problem I want to solve, you can imagine this distributed model. 
And then the other one is streaming. And here we're going to look at, you know, edges are inserted and deleted from an n vertex graph in a streaming fashion. So there's some log file at Facebook where every time some user becomes friends with another user or removes a friend because you know, they, they had an argument, I can see in my log that you know, so-and-so are now friends. So-and-so have ended their Facebook friendship. Okay, so I see this in a streaming fashion. And then at query time, <clears throat> I want to compute something about the graph. Again, I want to find the spanning forest or whatever. Okay. Now, you know, in principle, a graph on n vertices could have up to n squared edges. So, you know, in the streaming model, you could imagine needing n squared memory to remember what you need to remember about the graph to be able to answer later queries. Certainly, okay. a lot of graphs, a lot of huge graphs like the inter internet graph, Facebook graph, et cetera, there is kind of bounded average degree. Usually, you don't have n squared edges. Okay. But in principle, you could have up to n squared edges. So, a trivial algorithm would use n squared memory. <clears throat> And again, you know, in the other model, model number one, kind of a trivial thing that you could do is each vertex sends its entire neighborhood to the central server. But its neighborhood could have size you know, up to n minus one. Right? So you would be sending the central server a message of length linear in the, in the graph size. Okay. So the question is, can we, you know, in both of these models, you know, for various graph problems, can we do better? And kind of a theorem, this is due to on Guha and McGregor in 2012, is that for model like for for let's say spanning forest. In model one. You can get all the messages to have length at most uh, log cubed n. And then for model two, you can get space at most O of n log cubed n. And by the way, these are both watching you and myself showed that these are actually both optimal. We showed this last year. Okay. So I want to show you um, how Angu and McGregor's thing works in the last five minutes. I'm not going to show you all the analysis, but you'll get the bait. You'll get most of the idea. Okay, so first, remember now you've seen this case sparse recovery data structure. Um, so we'll use something called, we'll call the support find data structure from uh, Johari, Saglam, and Tardish. What does this do? This is um, query. So this is basically when someone says query, we return any i in the support of x. Okay. X might not be case sparse. X is allowed to be dense. Okay. But you know, if if x is the non-zero, if x is not the zero vector, just give me any index in the support of x. And um, how do Jahari Sagam and Tardo solve this? The basic idea is looks, you know, it's a similar picture to what you've seen a couple of times already. You basically have log n levels. You have a hash function. The probability that h of i is j is roughly one over two to the j. Now, what are each of these boxes? Each of these boxes are k recovery data structures.
So it looks, it looks a whole lot like the distinct element sketch, right? Um, and now the point is, you know, you just, uh, uh oh, did I, am I running out of it? Did I, did I lose connection again? I can see that the bottom box is not filling in. Hmm. Okay, well, anyway, I can, I can just talk as, as it's loading. Now, there it is. Okay, good. So, so what's the idea here? Like, the idea is look, so X has some support size, right? It might be huge, it might not. Think of K here as a, con uh, okay, great. Uh, I might get disconnected. Think of K here as like a constant, okay? So X has some support size. It's probably not, you know, it might not be constant. Could be as big as N, but, you know, roughly half the support gets hashed to the top box. A quarter of the support gets hashed to the second box. One nth of the support gets hashed to the bottom most box, right? So, um, Sorry, Jelani, it's uh, yeah, disconnected. I didn't notice. Yeah, let's see. I think I'm. Uh, okay, so I'll just talk, even though you can't see the image, and I'll try to reconnect as I'm talking. So if you look at that picture, right? So the point is, probably none of the support hashed to the bottom most level, right? So if you query that, it's going to tell you, oh, x is the zero vector, and then you know, probably also nothing hashed to the level right above that, etc. Until until you get to a level where level j where you know the support size over 2 to the j is a constant when the support size over 2 to the j is a constant then you know you're going to get you're going to get a non zero with good probability you're going to get a non zero vector at that level so when you query it you'll get it back and then now you can just return any entry in that vector as being in the support of the original vector okay so that's how they solve that now, how do you use that data structure to solve, say, spanning forest? And that's the thing that I need my board back for. Unfortunately, this is, yeah, I'm very sorry. I think maybe when I, you know, tomorrow, maybe I'll have to go in a, a different room. I, don't, I, I have great Wi-Fi connection on my iPad. It's just Zoom keeps kicking me out. I did see an article about Zoom dying on everybody in the country today. Uh, I don't know if this is part of that. But you all are connected just fine, so maybe not. I saw Samson had a question. Here, the distribution of i is roughly uniform for the support. Um, I think you're asking that question for the support find data structure. Uh, if so, there is a way to get that, that property. But I, for me, it doesn't matter. As long as I get anything from the support, I don't care whether it's uniform or not. Okay, so let's just try this last part. I will write on my actual laptop. Okay, so are you seeing this? Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, okay. So now the idea is like X is going to be in R and choose two, right? Where um, X E corresponds to like the to a possible edge E that could be in the graph. And let's pretend that like u u is less than v. Okay, so there are all these vertices in the graph, and vertices. Um, let's say that this is vertex one, vertex two, vertex three, etc. I'm actually going to have n different vectors, not just one, where this is vector you know x one, this is vector x two. Etc. This is vector x3, and each one of these vectors is going to store the edges that are incident upon that vertex. So x1 is only going to store edges that touch vertex one. So for example, if vertex one has edges to four, seven, and nine, then x1 is going to look at like this, 
So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Does that make sense? Okay. And let's say that vertex nine only has an edge to one, then x nine is going to look like minus one, zero, 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 zero. Where I put a minus one because nine is bigger than one. So, you know, that, that edge appears in two vectors. The edge one nine appears in the x one vector and it appears in the x nine vector. But in the x1 vector, oh, sorry, sorry. I, I, I just realized this is not how I wanted to draw it. So um, this is not what I wanted to do. Give me a second. These are not n-dimensional vectors. These are n choose two dimensional vectors, right? So there's basically a, 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 an entry corresponding to the potential edge one, two to the potential edge one, three, to the potential edge one, four, to the potential edge one, five, as well as the potential edge um, two, three, to the potential edge two, four, to the potential edge two, five, et cetera. There are n choose two entries. Now in the one, not in the one, four entry, there's going to be a one. In the one, seven entry, there's going to be a one. In the one, nine entry, there's going to be a one. This is the one, seven entry. This is the one, nine entry. Whereas X nine, in the one nine entry, there's going to be a minus one, and there's going to be zeros everywhere else. Does that make sense? So these are all entries two dimensional vectors, and you know that edge one nine appears in two vectors: the one vector and the nine vector. And by convention, in the one vector it'll be positive, in the nine vector it'll be negative. Okay. So in, in the in the larger of the two indices, it'll be negative. Okay. So if every if every vertex stored its corresponding vector exactly, we we you know this is a lossless uh, track of information about the graph. But you know now I'm I'm storing n cubed uh, dimensions basically, right? And there are basically n squared entries here, and there are n vectors, so n cubed. So it's pretty bad. However, what I'm going to store is not the vector, but I'm going to store the sketch of the vector. I'm going to store pi x1, pi x2, up to pi xn. Where here, this pi is the JST data structure, the Jahari Sagam Tarish data structure that solves support find. If you remember, it was log n levels of linear sketches. But log n levels of linear sketches is itself just one big linear sketch. Just stack the matrices on top of each other. Okay. So now, what's the what's the actual? Um, how do I do? I think this new new whiteboard. I know I'm running low on time, so let me let me try to wrap this up. So let's pretend. Let's fake run this on a graph. So here we have one. I said there's four seven. Oh, let me let me just do it differently. So two, five, three, seven, four, six, eight, nine. Take this graph. Okay. So initially we don't know anything, we don't know any edges in the spanning forest. So initially, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All these vertices are singletons each storing pi times their respective vectors. Now we can ask, we can ask pi x1. We can ask that data structure, support find. Give me anything in your support. What does that actually mean? It means give me an edge that's incident upon vertex one. That's what it means, right? So, you know, it's gonna give me something in the support. So maybe it's gonna give me five. It's gonna give me one five. One five is in the support which means there's an edge from one to five, okay? And then we're gonna ask two, give me something in your support. And then maybe two will also tell me five. Two five is in the support. And then we're gonna ask three. Well, there's only one option here. Three is gonna give me seven. 
we're gonna ask four, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so let's say four gives me six, six also gives me four, and then eight gives me nine, and nine gives me eight. So this is what I got from my support finds. So now what do I know? I know that all these blue edges are edges in the graph. So I can contract them and I'm learning about my connected components. I'm learning that one and five and two are in the same connected component. I know that three and seven are in the same connected component, et cetera. So now I know that basically I have this one connected component, which is like one, two, and five are all together. And I know that three and seven are together. And I know that four and six are together. And I know that eight and nine are together. Okay. Now, I would like to have that data structure, that support find data structure, that tells me edges that leave these. Tell me an edge that leaves the component one, two, five. Tell me an edge that leaves the set of vertices three, seven, that crosses that cut that, that goes outside the set. How can I get a data structure for these components though? And the beauty is, the beauty of the AGM sketch is that I can get that just by adding the data structures, right? If I look at pi x1, plus pi x2 plus pi x5. This is just pi times x1 plus x2 plus x5. OK. I can get this just by adding. And now, what does this do? Remember now, any edge that is inside of this set that doesn't cross the cut, it appears twice in these vectors once positively and once negatively, right? Like for example, the edge one five, it appears positively in X1 and it appears negatively in X5. So when I add them together, it gets zeroed out. So when I look at the vector X1 plus X2 plus X5, the support of that vector is the set of edges which cross the cut one, two, five versus the rest of the graph. So later in the next round, when I query 125, I'm going to get an edge that leaves 125. In this case, there aren't any. But for example, for 46, there are edges that leave 46. They go to eight toward 89, right? So in the next level, I can hope to get some edge that crosses this cut. Right. And what you can prove is basically after you know O of log n levels of this, um, I will have found the final list of connected components in the graph. There's some there's some small technicalities here, like in each of the rounds of these of, of this you know edge discovery, I can't use the same pi. I have to actually use a different fresh pi in each round because there's correlation and the randomness. You know that that's something that you can deal with. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you do this right, you'll get a you'll get a space bound of n log q den. Okay. Um, Okay, so I think I'm over time. I'm sorry again about the connectivity issues. I'll try to, I'll try to present from a different room of my house tomorrow where the Wi-Fi is stronger. Um, any, any questions? Any additional questions? Okay, seems to have good. So let's uh, thank Jelani and uh, Thank the audience also for the patience with the human difficulty. Uh, we're all done for today. Is there still a tea time, Nike? Uh, I'm not sure, actually. I think it might be announced over the email. So okay. Yeah. So check check get the time for the social activities. Thanks, Jelani. All right.